Welcome to another episode of Financially Irresponsible. I'm your host, Rakim Sabri, and I'm super excited to have you guys back. So last episode, we talked about financial elder abuse. Now I want to go to the other end of the spectrum and talk about what is referred to as financial enmeshment or um, also known as financial incest. And so uh, this target audience um, is, is dealing with children being injected before they are developmentally ready into matters of the finances within the household. Um, some common examples of this can look like having children screen calls for, uh, from creditors or discussing sensitive financial information with children before they can really do anything about it, parents taking money from children um, so that they can pay bills, or parents giving certain children uh, financial rewards um, or rewards that can, be, that can be perceived as financial rewards um, for uh, non-working tasks and not giving those same rewards to other children um, in the event of a parent separation, which we see uh, very commonly, um, where one parent may choose to do things financially for the child in order to win favor with that child over the other parent, and they may indicate to that child, hey, this is between us, don't tell you know mom or dad that we did this thing. And so um, the impact of financial enmeshment actually has kind of a long-standing impact on the development of the child and in the way that that child perceives and engages with money in their later life, in their adult life, um, based off of kind of the age in which that financial enmeshment started to occur um, or maybe the duration by which that financial enmeshment did occur and how that shows up in adulthood can look like a lack of boundaries or standing up for yourself, feeling obligated to, and this may be categorized as people pleasing, but feeling obligated to provide financially in instances where um, maybe it's best for that individual to keep the money to themselves. Basically giving of uh, what you have because you are so conditioned or so used to, particularly in the instance of parents or siblings, um, giving away large or small sums of money to solve their financial problems without really having a strong grasp or understanding of your own financial problems as kind of the subject in this conversation. And so financial enmeshment is um, one of the money disorders that has been written about in these psychological journals by um, such financial psychologists as Brad and Ted Klontz. Um, the recommended approach to solving financial enmeshment issues in, adult children, in, in adults who were dealing with enmeshment as children is financial therapy. And it's important for financial therapists and other financial professionals to be able to understand, recognize that financial enmeshment, first of all, exists, that it does occur, that we have a name for it, um, but also how to recognize signs of the impact of that financial enmeshment on the behaviors of the subject, whoever that might be. And so uh, financial planners, financial counselors, maybe even banking professionals will be able to understand through the lens of that individual's experience why certain decisions that don't look like they are advantageous on the surface to the individual are frequently being made. Now here's the dilemma. As a financial counselor, one of the things that is very important to the way that we practice is aligning an individual's values and their goals. So I've talked about this in the past, right? And if an individual has experienced financial enmeshment as a means for um, navigating the relationship that they have with their parents that is tied into a familial or cultural practice, it can be difficult to help that individual recognize that the behavior that they're engaging in is not truly one of their values, but more so um, that they are a victim of this particular uh, form of financial abuse. 
And in those instances, it's a tough conversation to have because when you're pulling back the layers of what somebody may interpret as a cultural, cultural driven or familial um, value, giving them any kind of advice to the contrary is going to be met with resistance. And so this is where the fields of financial therapy and financial counseling kind of diverge because it's important to understand founda foundationally why an individual is making a decision. What are their goals related to decision making pertaining to their finances? And what are the obstacles to them achieving those goals by way of their value system, by way of uh, will or skill on, or knowledge around being able to get out of the cycle of this behavior? Um, and financial therapists are going to help address the way that people view or perceive money. And so while I wear both hats as a financial therapist and as a financial counselor, it's important for me to articulate to the individuals that I'm working with what hat I'm wearing in that particular capacity and what recommendations I have through the lens of wearing that particular hat. So I know in some cultures it's very important for the child to contribute financially to the overall upkeep and running of the household, that everybody contributes in, in communal um, cultures, that is normal, that is okay. But when we look at um, American culture, um, and one that is often driven by consumerism and capitalism, and how can I use my money to influence outcomes, it's important to kind of pull back the layers and understand where exactly um, is abuse occurring and where exactly is kind of like this willful uh, participation or injection of uh, financial lessons, financial management, financial behaviors into the child's life. Um, when is it appropriate to introduce these concepts of financial education? And as Connecticut is one of uh, several states that have passed legislation to require personal finance classes in high school in order for students to graduate, the question often comes up, at what age is it appropriate to introduce financial literacy? And I say that, like, when air quotes, financial literacy to a child, because as soon as a child can understand the concept of money, is some, is some people's argument, to share, start to share with them how they should be managing money. But how you share that information and um, how you execute on the sharing of that information can look different and can, um, in some instances, from some perspectives, be considered financial abuse and from other perspectives can be considered laying down a framework for how that child is going to grow up and navigate their finances when they are independent adults and when they are engaging with other people. So how do we address financial enmeshment in adults who may have experienced it as children? And how do we prevent financial enmeshment from occurring in the household? Well, I think the, the second part of that answer is a little bit more complicated than the first, but for adults who see themselves in situations where um, it is a conflict of their will um, and what they are identifying as their values that um, they're giving, they're giving, they're giving their money away towards family members, um, older relatives, they're expected to be the retirement plan for their parents, um, they are maybe in a position where they're giving money away to their older and younger siblings, they're paying for college, they're buying cars, they're co-signing, they're engaging in a lot of financial behaviors that ultimately take away, first of all, from their pot, what it is that they're supposed to be building so that they can be uh, self-sustaining as an adult, but also they're overextending themselves, putting themselves into situations that make them vulnerable financially, and they recognize the conflict there, they can, they can engage a financial therapist or somebody who's qualified to understand, um, first of all, what is financial enmeshment? How does this create um, kind of a trauma response in that individual? And how do you de-escalate that to help them recognize the pattern of behavior and ultimately choose whether or not they want to continue to engage or not? 
um, when it comes to addressing or trying to prevent it in um, households with cho with active children, that's a little bit harder to do, right? Because we're not in everybody's household. We're not in everybody's kitchen or bedroom. We can't tell them what to do, what to say, how to engage with their children. But I think it's important to be conscious of the fact that as we give financial information and we give financial advice and we pound away at this movement in financial literacy, that we're not weaponizing financial literacy in a way that empowers individuals to abuse the movement by turning it against their children. And in the name of making my child responsible, in the name of making my child contribute, in the name of insert whatever the excuse is, um, I'm going to expose my child to the finances, take them to the bank, give them a debit card, let them deposit their money, take their money out of their account, s tell them about the tooth fairy or Santa Claus or whatever um, that relates to uh, the ups and downs of their bank account, or even in instances I've seen in my own community where children are listed as signers, I'm sorry, are, where there are bills placed in children's names, cable bills, phone bills, internet bills, um, the gas bill, the electric bill, placed in the child's name using the child's social security number, never to be paid until the child turns 18 and goes to apply for their own credit and recognizes that their credit has been ruined because their parent chose to put the put a bill in their name and they never paid on it. And so we see these cycles of behavior occur in different communities, and this is not a chastisement of those behaviors, it's a chastisement really of a system that forces the hand of individuals who may engage in these particular behaviors. So I'm coming up on the uh, end of a course that I've been taking over the winter called The Trauma of Money. Shout out to the Trauma of Money crew, um, co-founded by Chantel Chapman. And within this course, we are inspecting and kind of reimagining how capitalism looks, um, how the impact and how the harm of capitalism has forced certain behaviors that are usually frowned upon and that are usually uh, a chastisement of individuals operating in a scarcity or a survival modality, having to do things in order to survive. And in that um, understanding how to reframe these behaviors as symptoms of a greater issue, right, of the symptoms of the way that a system is, the way that the economic system that we participate in is designed um, it's hard to point the finger at the individual and say, you have to be completely accountable for your choices in this particular situation, even though you had to do what you had to do in order to put food on the table, in order to make sure that your children were clothed, to make sure that your children were cleaned, to make sure that your children are able to go out into the world and participate in, um, in this society, right? And so a lot of children in uh, black and Latino households start working well under what is considered the legal working age by doing odds and end jobs or jobs um, kind of under the table, off record, getting paid in cash so that they can support their families or taking jobs where they're watching ch other children. They are a child watching children so that their families can go out and work and make a higher income. And all of those are examples of financial enmeshment but it's a forced financial enmeshment that occurs because of the way that our system is designed, because of the way that the rates of inflation and the cost of living and the impact of uh, wage inequality and wealth inequality in certain communities looks. And so again, sharing information on financial enmeshment is not a chastisement of certain communities or the way that those communities engage, but it is recognized as a money disorder. And as I shared in the previous episode, how uh, we're talking about elder abuse and how to recognize it and where is it more likely to occur, we can draw parallels in the world of uh, financial therapy to financial enmeshment and how children are abused financially by being put in as kind of a shield or a scapegoat to certain financial pain points for adults who may be having a hard time or who may not be having a hard time navigating their financial landscape.
And so again, I think it's super important for us to be able to point out these things, give it a name, and then make informed decisions around the path that we want to take towards moving forward. Um, in a previous episode, I talked about the uh, money scripts and how those money scripts will show up in an individual. And I think about the money script of money vigilance. And in money vigilance, on the surface, it is usually something to be hailed as a good money behavior, right? Just as a reminder, there are four money scripts. There's money avoidance, there's money worship, there's money status, and there is money vigilance. And money vigilance is characterized by individuals doing exactly what they're supposed to do, just to an extreme. And so when you see examples of individuals who may be saving 50% or more of their income for the sole purpose of creating a padding to prevent themselves from uh, experiencing poverty in an excessive amount, but they're also afraid of investing in the stock market or they're afraid of investing in real estate, um, there's fear that drives these decisions. There's also the inability to enjoy the fruits of their labors. You're, ex you're seeing an example of money vigilance that on the surface, like, man, that person is that person's really handling it. They're super obsessed. They're super frugal. They're saving their money aggressively. They don't have any debt or they're paying down their debt aggressively. They're investing aggressively. They have a large balance sitting liquid in the bank account just in case. It's kind of like the, uh, the archetype of the doomsday prepper, right? Think about the doomsday prepper just in the context of finances. And so, yes, when, when everything goes crazy, the doomsday prepper who has cans and cans of, cans and jars of food and water stocked away and toilet paper and all of the things that we take for granted, that we enjoy, um, that person is gonna be the person that everybody's gonna want to know. But in the time that this individual is hoarding products so that they can prepare for this eventuality that they're perceiving as an eventuality, this collapse that they're perceiving as an eventuality, they're robbing themselves of the opportunity to actually enjoy the resources that they are hoarding. And so uh, financial hoarding is a thing and it can look like money vigilance. And so I just, I think it's super important to underscore that while things may look good outwardly, or they may look good on the surface, in terms of behaviors, in terms of actions, in terms of bank account balances, et cetera, et cetera, they can be driven by a greater pathology that can be addressed through financial therapy um, that is often not easy to identify on first glance. And the same concept can apply to financial enmeshment in children where we start bringing our children to the bank, letting them perform their transactions, making them buy things. It's a slippery slope to then taking advantage of that child and maybe their lack of cognitive ability around what's actually happening. What is, what is the value of a dollar um, in, in, in terms of buying things. Um, why are they picking up the phone and screening calls for creditors? Why are they being gifted in elaborate ways so that their love can be won by one parent over another or by a, a aunt or grandmother? And how does that show up? How does that impact? that child in adulthood, when it comes to navigating relationships, when it comes to uh, establishing boundaries, when it comes to expectations around how to receive love and how to give love, how does that open up um, for that individual in adulthood, them to be taken advantage of, them to be scammed, fraudulent activity to take place, and if we want to make a connection to the, to the previous episode, how does that create a pattern that can show up in late adulthood as um, elder abuse, right? Because 
pre the altruism that elder that elders who are susceptible to elder abuse have can be, and I'm not saying in all instances that they are, um, but is my strong hypothesis that can be tied into financial enmeshment that may have occurred in their earlier experiences, their earlier life. So super important to toss these concepts out for discussion, for general awareness. Again, these are um, not topics or concepts that I've created. These are concepts that do exist in psychological journals. Um, again, uh, Brad Klontz, financial psychologist, is um, documented as one of the authors for this and definitely speaks to how financial enmeshment can be addressed through financial therapy. And as a champion for financial therapy and its development and its circulation and its um, increasing popularity in the mainstream world as a part of the greater conversation that we have with uh, financial literacy and the way that financial education is delivered and the way that financial services are offered, it's super important for me to use this platform to talk about these concepts that may or may not be discussed in your traditional run-of-the-mill financial education courses or classwork. Um, these are specifically related to behavior, related to instances that um, may be tied into financial trauma, um, and financial therapy is its own discipline that stands on its own two feet that pull from best practices and empirical research from financial planning and uh, mental health the mental health field. Um, and so I'm super excited to, uh, to also share with you guys as we come to a close on this episode that while financial therapy is not a regulated term in the industry yet, that there is an organization that is working to standardize the practice of financial therapy called the Financial Therapy Association. And um, I am an active member in the Financial Therapy Association and a candidate for the Certified Financial Therapist designation, which just allows for me to practice under the, the umbrella or under the standards set forth by the Financial Therapy Association. Um, there are many financial therapists who are not, quote unquote, certified financial therapists through the Financial Therapy Association who are just as effective as any financial therapist. Um, but I'm super proud of the organization. I'm a proud uh, member and I will be a proud holder of that designation so that I can continue to offer expertise, authority, and services to individuals on the topic of financial therapy and bringing all of this information into the mainstream through platforms like this, through the blogs, through columns that I write for uh, publications like Forbes, through different podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. So um, wrapping this up, we have on one end of the spectrum, financial elder abuse that is occurring within a sensitive demographic. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have just as sensitive a demographic, children who have not developed the cognitive ability to understand money um, or who are developing the cognitive ability to understand money being injected into issues inappropriately so around money within the household called financial enmeshment. And I personally believe that these two things can be tied in how our behaviors manifest as middle adults going into uh, late adulthood. So this has been another fantastic episode of Financially Irresponsible. Again, I'm your host, Rakim Sabri, and I look forward to bringing you more information on finances, general finances, financial therapy, and financial counseling best practices. Until next time, thank you.
The Saybrook Fish House in Canton has been serving fresh seafood, chicken, and prime steaks for 40 years. Experience one of our three unique dining room settings, two with fireplaces, or relax in our cozy pub with a craft beer, wine by the glass, or specialty cocktail while enjoying a meal from our new Lighter Fair pub menu. Serving lunch and dinner Tuesday through Sunday, reservations accepted for parties of 2 to 42, gift cards always available. The Saybrook Fish House, nestled at the crossroads of routes 44, 202, and 179 in Canton. Hello, I'm Bill Meyer, Board Director for Nutmeg TV, your local public TV station. For over 30 years now, Nutmeg has brought countless local events, municipal meetings, and programs to our TV screens. To continue this important work, Nutmeg relies on the support of generous individuals like yourself. So we're reaching out today to ask for your monetary support. Together we can continue to amplify the voices and stories that make our community unique and vibrant. To make a donation, simply visit our website at nutmegtv.com or call the office at 860-321-7405 for assistance.